Thank you so much for coming out on this Sunday afternoon. It's great seeing you all here and, and sharing your afternoon with us. Uh, here you see the Moore Park College Wind Ensemble. I'll talk a little more about the ensemble as we're going along, but right now I want to get straight to some music. I'm so excited about the program we're about to share with you. In fact, I've been looking forward to this program, especially the second half, for at least a few years, looking forward to, man, I really wish we could perform that at some point. And today we are, and I hope you enjoy it. We're gonna start off, though, with a wonderful piece by the great French composer, is, uh, forgive me if I'm not pronouncing it correctly, but it's Camille saint saint is his name, and he, uh, historians look at him as a ch child prodigy just about on par with Mozart, and he lived during the late Romantic period, so the late 1800s, but unlike other innovative French Impressionist composers of his time, he was more of a traditional uh, but somewhat neoclassical composer. And in his lifetime, he only composed one opera, and it's titled, titled Samson and Delilah, and it's based on the biblical tale. And so we're gonna perform for you the dance bacchanal from the final scene of that opera, which depicts the savage dance of the priests before Samson enters, prays to God to restore his strength, and breaks the pillars of the temple, killing them all. And I, in fact, this is a, a pretty fitting piece to start our concert on a Sunday afternoon. So, so here we go. There's Dance Bacchanal from Samson Delilo by Camille saint -Saul. Thank you. 
Thank you. And as the program says, we're playing some of the uh, wonderful pieces by the masters of composition, not only from the 18th century, but also 19th century. And this next piece is going to be by the great, not only composer, but conductor. He used to be the conductor of the New York Philharmonic for a while. And many of you may know him as the composer of the musical West Side Story but he's also written a number of wonderful symphonies and overtures and great music that's been added to our repertoire over the years. And this next piece is a ton of fun to play. And in fact, uh, initially there was a conductor by the name of, if I can pronounce this Russian name <laughs> correctly, um, Mitslisov, excuse me, Mitslisov, Rostropovich was his name, and people, because they couldn't uh, pronounce that, they called him Slava to his friends. And he invited Leonard Bernstein to help him launch his inaugural concerts as the music director of the National Symphony Orchestra. And he also asked Bernstein to write a rousing new opening piece uh, for these festivity, <laughs> festivities for the for the National Orchestra. And this overture that Bernstein wrote, uh, which we're gonna perform for you, uh, the world premiere took place in October 11th, 1977. And for those of you taking tally, that was the year I was born. Uh, but this was, born, this was per, uh, performed initially that year uh, with Rostropovich uh, conducting his orchestra at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. In the, in the Performing Arts Center of Washington, D.C. And the, the theme, what you're going to hear, this main theme of Slava, it's, it's really a vaudevillian razzmatazz. Uh, and it's filled with slide-slipping modulations and uh, sliding trombones. There's a, uh, eventually leads into a canonic theme, if you don't know what a canon is. That is otherwise known as a round. So say you uh, singing row, row, row your boat with the kids and one person starts it, then another person starts it later and, and it's about two people singing the same song but starting at different times. And uh, you're gonna hear that happening in this piece. But it happens in seven, eight time uh, with a seven, eight time signature, which is uh, a lot of fun. And then there's, after that, there's a development in which these two themes are uh, recur in uh, different order. Then at the end, you're going to hear a quotation of Modest Mussorgsky's opera, uh, Boris Gudnov. And what he does in that opera, the Russian word Slava is yelled. And Slava in Russian, it means glory. And it was a perfect uh, way of him paying homage to his friend, Slava, who was starting this orchestra. So here is Leonard Bernstein's Slava. Thank you. 
We're going to throw a couple more pieces at you, one from the Romantic era and another one from the 20th century. And this next one I really need to give a little background on because all of you will recognize it. And approximately between the years of 1848 and 1874, so we're talking, uh, what, 25, 26 years, Richard Wagner, don't call him Wagner because you'll get laughed out of any... I know, tea party. Uh, Richard Wagner wrote the libretto, the words, and the music to his Der Ring die Nibelungen, which is tra translated at, in English as the Ring of Nibelung, which is a four nights long opera. You have to think about it. You have to go attend the opera four nights in a row in order to watch the entire story. And the plot of this, what he called music drama, he didn't call them operas, he called them music dramas. Uh, the plot of it is based on Norse mythology, uh, and it revolves around a magic ring that grants the power to rule the world, forged by a Nibelung dwarf, Alberic is his name, from gold he stole from the Rhine maidens of the river Rhine. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Maybe... Uh, Another massive work that you'd have to watch four nights in a row in order to take the whole thing in based on Norse mythology. Although with, with modern technology, I guess you can binge watch the entire thing in one day. <laughs> All right, I'll give it away, yeah. So similar, but not, it's based on Norse mythology, not the same story as Lord of the Rings, but uh, similar. And, and so, the, the Ride of the Valkyries, which we're going to perform, is an, just an orchestral selection from uh, Die Valkyrie, which is the second night of this four-night-long uh, opera, or music drama, excuse me. And the, the Valkyries, what they were, was they were nine daughters of Wotan, or Wotan, excuse me, uh, ruler of heaven and earth and Erda, the goddess of fate. And while the Valkyries had been the daughters of a wild love that had brought disgrace to Wotan, he employed them to gather fallen heroes from the battlefield and to create a defense for their city, Valhalla. And so the Rite of the Valkyries, the scene that we're going to perform for you, it takes place at the beginning of Acts 3. And as the Valkyries return from the battlefields, it's a vivid scene as they carry fallen warriors on horseback while the storm subsides and lightning is flashing wildly. And it really displays how Wagner's innovation when it comes to compositional techniques. This one specifically uh, about his creation of a light motif, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. All right, good. I've got my uh, professor of musicology here <laughs> playing in the group from Moore Park College, Professor Wardzinski, checking up on me. So, uh, uh, trombones, you want to play this light motif for us? And a light motif is a, a melodic idea that depicts a specific character in the, in the story. Here we go. And one, two. <gasps> All right. 
So that's our leet motif. And you can probably see how it's come of age throughout time because whenever you hear that motif throughout the music drama, then it automatically cues, oh, that's the Valkyries. Whereas uh, we have somebody that's going to play another Leeds motif and see if you could think of the character for this. Go for it. <laughs> All right, so everybody got that character too, correct? <laughs> so you can imagine who Wagner had a huge impact on compositionally over time. And so here is Ride of the Valkyries by Richard, excuse me, Ricard, that's probably a better way of saying it, uh, Wagner. Thank you. 
Thank you. We're going to move back to the 20th century now with one of the great uh, composers of the 20th century. His name is George Gershwin, and sadly he lived a very short life. He, but he made a huge impact with the short life that he lived. And he was a great American composer and pianist whose compositions span both the classical and the popular, pop, popular genres of the time. And he composed some of the most well-known American originated orchestral works of, of all time, such as Rhapsody in Blue, An American in Paris, the opera Porgy and Bess, uh, but unfortunately, that was before his tragic death, resulting from a brain tumor when he was 38 years old. And uh, this arrangement that you're going to hear is of some of his American songbook standards. And in this uh, arrangement, uh, entitled Gershwin Tribute to Love, are some of his best-known love songs, including It's Wonderful, Love is Here to Stay, they, can, they can't take that away from me and embraceable you. Thank you. 
Thank you again for uh, waiting until the end of the concert. It's much appreciated and enjoying this afternoon of music with, uh, with us. This next piece of music we're going to perform for you is one of my favorite compositions pieces of all time. It's just epic in nature, and I hope we do it justice. <laughs> uh, it's uh, entitled Scheherazade by Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov. And uh, Rimsky-Korsakov's probably best known for his composition, Flight of the Bumblebee, which I'm sure some of you may be familiar with. And he, along with Mili Belkarev and uh, Alexander Brodin, Cesar Kui, and Modest Mussorgsky, they were part of a group called the Russian Five, or Mighty Handful. And they were Romantic period composers from the 19th century or a Russian composer specifically, and their aim was to produce a specifically Russian kind of art music, rather than one that imitated the older uh, European music or relied on European style conservatory training. So along with their harmonic, textural, timbral, rhythmic innovations, uh, expressing their Russian dominance and power, which is a theme that you might see in world news still go on to this day. These composers, they fearlessly tackled previously untouched topics in their music, such as political themes and even erotic fantasies. And his suite that we're going to play for you, Scheherazade, it's based on scenes from the story One Thousand and One Nights, or otherwise known as The Arabian Nights. And he wrote an introduction to this work, uh, which is quoted. He says, the Sultan Shirayer, or Shir Shirayer, excuse me, I think it's Shirayer, uh, convinced that all women are false and faithless, vowed to put to death each of his wives after the first nuptial night. <laughs> but the Sultana Scheherazade saved her life by entertaining her lord with fasc fascinating tales told Syriatum, or in order, chronological order, for a thousand and one nights. The sultan, consumed with curiosity, postponed from day to day with execution of his wife and finally repudiated his bloody vow entirely. Or in other words, this, uh, this sultan kept marrying women because he, he was a misogynist and he ended up killing them all after his first night with them, but... Scheherazade was able to entertain him with all these stories, and as a result, he changed his mind and no longer thought that way about women. And uh, so the first movement of this piece, it depicts her first story describing Sinbad's. In fact, Sinbad, that character, is introduced first in this story, the Arabian Nights. And uh, so this first story, or first movement, depicts uh, Sinbad's fantastic adventures sailing throughout the seas east of Africa and south of Asia, encountering magical places, monsters, and even supernatural phenomena. And the moments in which the action stops and you hear just the flute solos with the piano, that, those actually symbolize Scheherazade telling the tale. And then the rest of it is the action of her tale. And this happens throughout the movements of this piece. The second movement begins with Scheherazade again telling the tale represented by the flute, and clarinet, and the piccolo along with the piano. And so that's the composer's representation of, the, of her actually talking to him and then when the action starts that's when it's uh, going into the story that she's telling. And uh, he continues in the second movement to tell the story of the calendar prince However, he doesn't specify exactly which one or one of the calendar princes. And instead, you hear him really just depicting a real sense of the mystery of the Orient. And then the third movement depicts a tender love story between the young prince and the young princess. And the themes from this movement are probably the most well-known uh, of 
some of you may even recognize the melodies of the third movement. They're the, they're the best known of the entire composition. And then the closing fourth movement begins with the Sultan. We're back to them interacting, Scheherazade and the Sultan interacting with one another. And that first strong theme is the Sultan expressing his impatience, wanting the stories to continue. And Scheherazade then, it, it calms down and she starts telling these stories, and that's depicted this time by the trumpets and then the flutes as well. And Sinbad, this time in this story, Sinbad returns from his voyages to festivities in Baghdad, and he yearns for more adventure, so he heads out into uncharted waters where he, his, uh, sh he loses his ship in a storm. And the power of these stories ends up convincing the sultan to no longer kill his wives. And it, this, so the end of this fourth movement is actually very serene and pe peaceful, belonging to Scheherazade uh, earning her free freedom. So this is uh, Nikolai Rimsky Korsakov's Scheherazade.
Thank you. 
Thank you.